this is the one of the best examples uh, you know to reconstruct the stages in the way in which this ash mound was built over a period of 500 years this i am talking about this 500 years only now 15 years ago could not have said the life history of this mound is 500 years because there are several hundred couple of hundred ash mounds across this landscape some have a very short lifespan of 50 years some have 100 years some have 150 years or so the ams radiocarbon dating and even now we are now trying OSL optically simulated luminescence dating. They are trying to help us fix the episodes in the way cattle dung was accumulated. You know, it was accumulated and during a particular part of uh, uh, the year uh, associated with the ritual activity. And it was set on fire at very high temperatures, up to about 1200 degrees or so. That led to the vitrification of the cattle dung because silica was mixing into it. A such high that fusion of silica in the cattle dung gave rise to that structure. Oh, so initially they laid a gravel platform in this particular site. It, it may be the case at many other sites as well. They, they were not simply dumped on an uneven ground surface. They used to level the surface. If the surface is not hard, they would create a platform. And this we see here at you know at Kuditani. And on top of that, we see the you know there is a stratification within that. In terms of highly burnt, vitrified ash, then you have relatively less burnt and soft ash, and then you have a soil layer sometimes, and then again a vitrified horizon. So this kind of uh, cyclicity is seen, and uh, it also represents the episodic activity. So that is how, it's, uh, and the fact that each of these uh, layers or stratum that we see uh, has these material cultural remains like stone axes, you have pottery, pot sheds, and then animal bones, especially cattle and so on. Another interesting that, uh, thing we observed was archaeozoological analysis of the material. All varieties, sheep, goat, and then you know buffalo and uh, cattle um, bones were there. I said this is a ritual animal. And further, it is further supported by the fact that none of the uh, cattle bones that were recovered from these uh, ash mounds do not sh do not show calcination. And they are not calcined. They are not. They have not experienced burning, and there are no cut marks. You know, normally bones are cleaved, extract marrow. Whereas we see these deliberate cut marks on sheep goat bones, but not on cattle bones. So it was not consumed by the dom people who domesticated cattle here. So these are all episodic, uh, you know, I mean, and this happens to be the largest one. From base to top, it is about 45 meters, and the perimeter is 1.5 kilometers. And we have been able to protect this from further destruction because the highway expansion was taking place. So we approached the local authorities. We requested the, 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 the contractors, civil contractors, to realign the highway. Uh, you know, now it is a loop there. We have spent nearly 1.5 crores uh, to develop this. And uh, very soon we are getting large bulls uh, to the height of 15 feet or so uh, installed there. That process is going on. It's not true because archaeologically it is very well established. The developments in Anatolia is much later than the, what happened in Southwest Asia in the Tigris Euphrates Valley, especially that region east of the Mediterranean, south of the Jagros Mountains and so on. The transition from hunting gathering to early agriculture took place in the foothills of this. This is an area where we have wild wheat and barley and so on. And that is an area also goat. Goat is the, not of Indian origin. It was introduced into India. So the developments which the center place theory is still valid, although many people criticized when it was uh, proposed by uh, Gordon Child, but early, early beginnings took place in that fertile crescent area. So expansion towards Europe, as I mean Anatolia is included in Europe, is much later in time because the developments has, have been very well dated in all these regions by radiocarbon dating, we have AMS radiocarbon dating. They clearly tell us that antecedents were in this particular Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel. You know, there are so many sites, you know, um, which have given us very clear evidence of these transitions. What we have pre-pottery Neolithic, you know, it is called aceramic Neolithic in the beginning. Then we have proper pottery Neolithic and so on. But otherwise, Anatolia is a later development. Like even in India, the west to eastward movement of these agricultural communities from Iranian plateau took place towards the Balochistan. 
that interaction also gave rise to a you know, development of Neolithic way of life as reflected in the site called Mehergad. You know, we have a lot of input coming from, barley happens to be native to Balochistan region, goat was introduced, cattle is native to this area, and then we have very clear evidence in this region. That is the hot spot, Iran, you know, Iraq and those areas. Anatolian situation is not, according to me, is not valid. And there are a series of new publications. Chattalayuk is a later site, as I understand. They were easily available in the landscape itself, in the immediate uh, landscape. They didn't have to bring them from distance. They were deliberately uh, placed on the ground in a circular fashion. So that marks the uh, area of a house, individual house. And then you have the uh, mud, mud, uh, mud, mud floor, and then you have uh, these thing, post holes all around these circular boulders. And then you have a uh, superstructure. Um, I always tell whenever I talk about this site, I said, this is such a huge site and what has so far been done since its discovery in 18, 1860s was the site was discovered. 1870s, it was the time when food came and confirmed that this is a Neolithic site. Since then, periodic investigations have been going on with new methodologies and new problems to address in terms of reconstructing the cultural aspects of these early uh, settlers here. Um, I have a feeling that we have not understood more than 10% of what I have, you know, what we have been able to recover from the site. And the, given the situation that the landscapes are bit getting modified at such a rapid scale, we are bound to lose many. And I always been pleading that it's not the problem of individual archaeologists, it is the problem of the country. It's the problem of the government of India, Archaeological Survey of India. I've been repeatedly requesting them, please develop a cultural resource management policy for India, which is non-existent. So whenever people like us want to do some such fast track salvage archaeology, there are problems of getting license from the Archaeological Survey of India. And when we have some new method, you know, helping us to retrieve information which we could not do otherwise, you know, if we apply for permission, there are restrictions and so on. That is why it's a very difficult situation. Uh, but anyway, we have to be happy with whatever we are doing. And this actually prompted me to set up that museum and to make people aware. You see, if, we, if the government cannot do anything, people who live in the, in the region where these archaeological sites of India are located, that will benefit us to a great extent. We had an exciting time when we were doing this outreach archaeology in Karnul region, an uh, area called uh, Jwalapuram area. We conducted, we used to go to schools, every house we used to visit with pamphlets about the archaeological wealth, which they are not aware. And the children were also, we demonstrate how these type of stone tools were made and demonstrate them, then take them to our trench areas and so on. They were, within a week's time, we, we, we saw to children running with pieces of antiquities, you know. Sir, we found this there, we found this there and so on. So we used to go and they were really good uh, spots where we could, uh, you know, really map. Uh, in archaeological activity there. So it is, it is a situation which is beyond, you know, individual country. Now, in fact, at Sanganakalu itself, we have freshwater fish bones indicating that, you know, there is a nearby river is about 10 kilometers away from the site. You have a river called Vedavati or Hagari and so on. So that fish, uh, you know, was part of their diet was procured from those areas. And then, as I said, there were a large number of these ponds and pools at that point of time. Hunter-gatherers were already familiar with aquatic food resources. So through freshwater, you know, these are all inland sites. So freshwater fish, you know, aquatic resources were available. And there is evidence. In fact, um, uh, there is evidence for sea fish remains uh, in inland sites in northern part of, uh, you know, Deccan. There is, a, there is a continuing evidence, yeah because the hunter-gatherers were basically fishermen. So they adapted to coastal areas and also inland water, you know, areas.